This podcast was produced by ORFM Dunedin with support from New Zealand On the Air. Kia ora katoa and welcome to a show celebrating Writer, the university's annual creative writing competition. I'm Nicola Cummins. And I'm Lisa Dick. We're both staff members at the university. I'm the university's publication editor and Nicola is a teaching fellow in the English and Linguistics programme. Nicola and I have been running this competition together for the past few years after launching it as part of the university's 150th celebrations back in that glorious pre-pandemic year 2019. The competition aims to celebrate the creativity of Otago staff and students and this year, for the first time, we also opened it up to alumni. Otago research shows that being creative is really good for mental health and so we felt it was important to foster and support that. The competition's been popular each year attracting many entries. We were particularly pleased with how many entries we received from alumni this year, and that included many living around the globe. That's right. Not only did our entries come from staff and students at all of our Otago campuses around New Zealand, they also came from alumni spread around the world, and we had close to 100 entries. Many of our entrants told us they were grateful for a competition that motivated them to sit down and write. As usual, we asked our entrants to enter either a poem or a short story, and also, as usual, we devised a writing prompt. As we collectively move forward from the pandemic years, this year our prompt was Brave New World. In a moment, you'll hear our winners reading their entries, but first we'll introduce you to our judge. We're lucky enough to have a successful New Zealand writer on staff at Otago. Well, actually, we have several of them. But this year, Craig Cliff agreed to be our judge, and it's been our pleasure and privilege to work with him. Craig is Net Carbon Zero Program Manager at the University's Sustainability Office and the author of two novels and a short story collection. In addition to fiction... Craig has published poetry, essays and reviews, and he's been a newspaper columnist. He joins us in the studio now. Kia ora, Craig. Kia ora. Thanks for having me. As I mentioned earlier, we had nearly 100 entries this year. What was your overall impression of the works when you sat down to judge them? Um, It's always a real privilege to see um, that many works across a a range of people in different uh, stages of their lives and stages of their careers and stages of their studies. And it was really interesting to me to be taken to different different worlds, um, distant planets, um, under the under the sea, um, thinking about the the lives of native birds and from their perspective. So, lots of lots of zaniness. Uh, lots of creativity, so that's a real privilege. Um, it was also interesting to see how people had taken the theme of Brave New World and applied that to the COVID-19 pandemic and sort of that the new normal concept and thinking about how we are entering into this Brave New World. I think particularly for staff, it seemed to be a resonant theme. A lot of our staff um, have come from overseas to, to live in New Zealand and thinking about that break with their homeland has seemed to be quite a, a, a strong um inspiration for, for their poetry and for their short stories. So, it's, yeah, as I say, really fascinating to see what's interesting to people, what's motivating to them to actually get down and write um, in 2022. Craig, before we hear each of the winners reading the, their work, we'd love it if you could give us your opinion of their poem or story and tell us what made them stand out as winners. We're going to start with our poetry winners, and our student winner was Lennox Tate, who is finishing up degrees in law and commerce. His very witty poem flipped the theme, as you'll hear. Craig, what did you love about this poem? Um, As I said, um, the theme is a jumping off point, um, and it's... you're expecting the poem or the short story to relate to it in some way. And I responded um, with glee whenever someone took it in a new direction. And this one was one where, as I say, um, it's a bit dad joke adjacent, the way that they take the theme of Brave New World. Um, And they really go for it, you know, um, hammer and tongs, trying different forms. It it moves around on the page. Um, And I thought... You know, here's someone who's brought a lot of energy to this. Here's somebody who's, um, yeah, as I say, really gone for it. And that stuck with me, that level of energy and, and enthusiasm. Thanks, Craig. It's now our great pleasure to introduce Lennox Tate. 
Kia ora Lennox, thanks for joining us. Good morning, thank you for having me. Now, tell us about your work. Um, yeah, sure. So initially I saw this competition, um, you know, I was just scrolling through my emails, I was procrastinating for an assignment, um, and this thing really caught my eye. And then this theme, Brave New World, um, I read the book uh, years ago back in high school. And while I don't remember a lot of the details, I remember that I appreciated the work, but I didn't enjoy it very much. I thought it was, you know, a bit dark, a bit grim. And so I saw the theme and immediately just wanted to flip it a little bit on its head. Um, and then I think the supermarket New World was just the most logical choice. Um, I really like the idea of turning mundane life experiences into these big grand adventures, you know, something really interesting. And I really like to extract the humour from situations that don't seem that um, humourful at first glance. And so that's kind of what I hope to do with this piece. Thank you, Lennox. And we all do love a pun. Uh, so now we'd love to hear your poem. Absolutely. Though at a glance this piece appears extremely plain and played, a rather mundane tradition, a far cry from Orwell's 84. Please observe with eyes and ears, your caution should be paid. Behold my dystopian expedition to the grocery store. Act 1. Meat. Basket in hand, confronted with brands. What chicken should I opt for? Skinless or skin on? Looking at the prices, am I sure they're not wagyu and filet mignon? Basket in hand, did they touch land? Were these creatures looked after in their life? Or brought up in cages, a practice running rife? Basket in hand, should I take a stand? The guilt to be the predator, it preys upon my mental. So I leave the delicatessen and opt instead for lentils. Act 2. Canned Goods Less Soma, more Roma. Too many tomatoes for which I can opt. Diced or pureed, whole or chopped. Wait, what am I doing? That one's price has dropped. Less Soma, more Diploma. Fish oil is brain food for the student. So tuna seems the choice most prudent. If only the odour was less pursuant. Less Soma, more Goma. Drawn to the maple syrup and other baking stuff, I remember that I could do with some egg whites to fluff. Oh, you use aquafaba? Please, I'm calling your bluff. Act 3. The Conversation. Oh. Oh no. They've seen me. A fairly distant friend. You don't know them well, and they don't really know you. But the mutual eye contact was made. We each approach, anticipating a stilted, awkward chat. Double think. Use it, half for this, half remembering the list. How is your flat going? I can't forget about trim milk. I saw your LinkedIn, congrats on the job. Have they dropped the price on oranges yet? You going to check out the gig this weekend? Shoot, was it wet food or biscuits the cat needed? Eventually, the conversation gives way to awkward silence. Promises to catch up soon are made. Smiles are shared, he paces away. Relief, mental list still intact. Now I just need, wait a minute, oh no, go on. Act 4, Dairy. In spite of utopian beliefs, cheese isn't $4 a block. Wow, what a shock. It's never been more timely to have a hate for lactose. Fair, I suppose. Almond, soy, coconut and oat milks, everywhere in sight. But prices aren't slight. Don't ever get me started on the prices for prisms of butter, I say, with a shudder. Act 5. Fruit and Vegetables I'm lost as to the reason. Is foodstuffs performing treason? But whenever I try, the produce I buy is never the stock that's in season. Act 6. Self-checkout The first dilemma. Avoid the chocolate bars. Resist temptation. The welcome message from the pre-programmed AI is little comfort. Yes, swipe the club card. Can't wait to save so many. Cents? 14 cents? What was I thinking? There's no way this halt would fit in one bag alone. Act 7. The Escape. Passing out the gliding doors gives rise to some reflection. Fabric bags within my claws I leave with this perception. To the staff, I owe my gratitude for the service they provide. 
Without their selfless attitude, there's no way we'd survive. Huxley's magnum opus got things right and some things wrong. Now dragged into focus, I write a poem far too long. Although Elder's Tale may not be the future which we seek, Braving New World is something I do almost every week. Thanks so much, Lennox. We're going to continue with poetry and hear from our staff and alumni winners. Yes, up next is our staff winner, Abby Smith. Abby is a professor of marine science who studies shell geochemistry and ocean acidification. She's also a very keen writer and has been for years and was inspired for this competition by verse 2 of All My Hope on God is Founded by Joachim Neander as translated by Robert Bridges. Though with care and toil we build them, tower and temple fall to dust. Craig, what made this entry stand out to you? This one was um, different to some of the others where there was lots of um, uh, energy, um, but maybe the form was a little bit helter-skelter. This one, there was so much care and so much attention, just as the first line sort of talks about. So it was really form was matching content. I thought that was it was really thoughtful um, and really well done. And I, I thought, you know, this being the staff um, category, I thought, oh, this must be someone from religious studies. They're using, you know, these re- religious motifs. So it was really interesting to find out, as with all of these, who the winners were um, and to find that um, Abby is in marine science. And it's just amazing what sort of creative people we have throughout the university. Thanks Craig and now we're thrilled to welcome Abby to the show. Tēnā koe Abby. Kia ora. Tell us about your poem and how you came to write it. Well I've been writing poetry since I was a teenager and I'm 61 now so that has been a long time um, and I, uh, I, I always sort of look at things and, and become inspired by them and, and the thing that this particular poem comes from is Uh, First of all, the Anyway poem, which is purported to be written by Mother Teresa, but really was written by Kent Keith. And the line that is particularly relevant here is, what you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyway. I find that really powerful, um, the idea that it really doesn't matter. And then I was um, singing at church, and uh, the hymn, All My Hope on God is Founded, which was written in 1680, so it's... um, pretty universal, I guess, translated much later. Um, And the line that struck me was, though with care and toil we build them, tower and temple fall to dust. So I was thinking about things passing and moving on and and breaking. And of course, I'm getting older, so I think about that more often. And um, that's where this poem came from. Abby, given your profession as a a scientist, uh, do you find much time for writing? Or was this a a bit of a one-off? Well, no, I'm lucky to be part of a writing group. It's called Poems, Prayers, Psalms, and Prose, and is based up in Opaho. And uh, I wrote this for them, and they really liked it, which is why I was brave enough to submit it for the competition. Thank you, Abby. And now we're going to hear you recite your poem. Thank you very much. It's called Falling, Falling. Somewhere a child cries because her block tower has fallen down. So much care, so much time, so much attention we spend on our things, building towers of blocks. Making calls, making meetings, making progress, we focus on our things, our handmade towers of blocks. Growing taller, spreading wider, becoming older, we carefully nurture our things, our growing towers of blocks. Gathering, planting, making, singing, painting, we create and collect our things, our pretty tower of blocks. Alas, humans, every tower falls, every dream dies, every temple goes to dust, even you, even you. But shall we not care, not build, not nurture, not create? Is transience the fatal flaw? We all come, we all go. After all, after all. Could we learn slowly that things have value, though they will not last? Like a sandcastle, like a sidewalk painting, like a handful of daisies, like an apple pie, like me, like me. 
Let us care about things, though they pass. Let us joyfully build, though it will fall. Let us carefully nurture, though it will die. Let us create and make again, until we are gone. Somewhere, a child picks up her blocks and begins again. Thanks, Abby. And now for our last poem. The winner of our alumni poetry category was Giles Graham. His poem is called It Was Not the New World I Feared. Craig, what did you love about this poem? What I loved about this poem, this was one of the ones that probably stuck with me the most, the one that I thought about um, the next day and the day after that. And the reason is the theme or the, 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 the subject that it deals with is the anxiety preceding the birth of your second child after having a somewhat traumatic experience with the birth of the first child. Um, without giving too much away, it doesn't just cover that, it ends in a different place and it's sort of a more of an uplifting ending and I thought it had two things going for it. One was this, I hadn't seen this topic explored much in, in, um, in poetry or in fiction um, so it was something fresh and something that really got me thinking. Having had um, gone through two, um, two having two children, I was going to say having gone through two births but I don't <laughs> want to take claim for that um, but and the second thing was that uplifting ending because I think uh, um, uh, in a lot of um, these uh, writing competitions, people pick really traumatic events, and that's that's great. It's, it's something that um, you can compress a lot of meaning into a short amount of space. But to twist it and have something uplifting, that was really <laughs> a welcome thing for me as the judge. Now we're going to hear from Giles Graham. Uh, Giles graduated in 2016 uh, with a degree in physics and mathematics, and he's now working as an epidemiology analyst for ESR. Uh, Giles, please tell us about your poem. Kia ora, Nicola. My poem, uh, it's called It Was Not the New World I Feared, and it was written uh, shortly after the birth of my second child. Um, I often find, or I have found in the, after the, each child, there's been a flurry of poetic activity, uh, perhaps because I've had time off and I haven't been working, perhaps the mania of sleep deprivation, but whatever the reason, uh, again, I had that. And, th and this is what came out of it this time. It was a reflection on the fact that we had a lot of fears going into parenthood again. Like we were still looking forward to it, but having your first child is, is frightening and scary and there's so much new and it feels really overwhelming at times. And I was, I expected particularly that it would be the same again. It would be the same sort of overwhelming um, anxiety and tension around this newborn, but um, and so I was just so relieved when um, Fia, our second child, arrived, and it was really smooth, really smooth delivery. And suddenly, like I could feel the accumulated wealth of knowledge that we'd picked up over the last two years, kind of guiding me and reassuring me in what to do. Um, and so this poem was kind of written out of that, out of reflecting on the relief I felt. Oh, that's a uh, oh, yeah. that's a lovely piece of context for your work. Uh, so, can we hear it now, please? You absolutely can. Yes. So, yes, my name again is Giles Graham, and the poem is called "It Was Not the New World I Feared." I thank the Lord. It was not as we expected from our first child. The drowning sensation, taut days pressed as leaves from a fraught wilderness the anxiety undercurrent. When, in open-mouthed anguish, our second son drew a small and shuddered breath, the old grip of fear found, instead, a cry soft as a plum falling in summer, smaller than a periwinkle, gentle as a pastor shell, for the weight of the bed covers on the first night, for the coolness of dark, for the same world I loved, just richer. Thank you so much, Giles, um, and I'm sure many parents will be identifying with the situation that you've uh, outlined uh, in your poem. So thank you once again. Thanks, Giles. We're now going to move on to our three winning short stories. Our stories were limited to 2,500 words, and we were really impressed by the many and varied ways our writers interpreted our prompt and the excellent stories they produced. It wasn't an easy job for Craig to choose our winners. No, but we made him do it anyway, and we love the choices he made. Craig, what was it like picking the winners from the stories? 
Yeah, it was interesting thinking about the poetry and, and the short stories. The big difference, obviously, is the length and the, the time it takes to read a short story versus a poem. And so I reread the poetry quite a lot. Um, and you find yourself, it isn't just natural, being a bit impatient with the short stories. So that any advice to anyone thinking about writing and um, entering short story competitions is you've got to ju- grab the judge. Um, you need to be nice and clear in the beginning. I like to be transported somewhere new, but I need to be also comfortable when I'm being transported somewhere new. And so the successful stories were, were doing that. It was nice. I felt like it entered into a new wor- world, like entering into a warm bath. Craig, we'll start with our student winner, Jessica Bent. Jessica's in her final final few days of her theology PhD, and her story aimed to explore the idea of Earth in the near future. It's entitled My Friend the Stranger. Craig, what drew you to this story? So there was a lot of sci-fi, um, people taking Brave New World um, and taking it in science fiction um, directions, and that was really great. I think this was probably the most successful um, entry that, that did that, because, as I was saying, it it felt like I knew this world and I knew these characters. And so lots of thought and care had been put into the details that were being presented. Um, and there was just that right mix between I don't know what this world is and, and you know, all of the elements, but I feel like I'm, I'm finding out as we're going. So I never felt uncomfortable. And, yeah, and it, and it really went off in a, in a great direction. Thanks, Craig. It's now our pleasure to introduce you to Jessica. Kia ora, Jessica, and welcome. Hello. Um, Jessica, tell us about your story for the competition. Um, Yeah, so when I saw the brief uh, prompt, I went straight to like Huxley and I read that in high school and he's an amazing writer but it wasn't the content didn't resonate with me so I was like all right what can I do to explore that sort of that idea of a brave new world and I love sci-fi and so I wanted to kind of write something along those lines and I got to explore both a new world um through our perspective, and then our Earth as a new world through our character's perspective, which was a really fun interweaving, I think. Awesome. And now we're going to hear Jessica's story. All right. My friend, the stranger. I'm often asked what the most significant moment in my life was. I usually spin some line about being accepted into the academy. That's not strictly true. It was an important moment in my life. I don't know if I've ever felt prouder of myself as I did that day when the notice arrived congratulating me on winning one of 10 spots in the Star Searcher program. Despite that celebrated event, the real moment my destiny changed forever was much earlier. When I was only five or six rotations old, one of my favorite pastimes was to crawl through the small, dusty tunnels on my father's property. I'm still not sure what they were originally for, but to a little girl with stories in her head and curiosity in her blood, they were the height of excitement. I'd found a new tunnel near Father's laboratory, and every warning he'd ever given me about not playing near the building flew from my head. I reached down, my small fingers curling around the bars covering the entrance to my new hiding place. With the grate out of the way, I wiggled down into the opening, dust and vinmal webs clinging to my robes. I had fun exploring the tunnel's twists and turns, that was, until I heard a strange sound. I paused, my fingers curling into fists, causing my nails to bite into the sensitive skin of my palms. I'd never heard anything like it. It sounded almost like a cross between a juca pup and a mungal chick. It crooned and changed tones and pitch, sliding up and down in an eerie but enticing way. The sound continued to echo through the tunnel. I chewed the inside of my cheek. Part of me wanted to crawl out of that tunnel as fast as my small hands and knees could take me. The other part, the much larger part, burned with curiosity. I had to know what was making that sound, the possibility that it could be one of Father's experiments never even crossed my mind. Crawling forward, I followed the sounds echoing up through the narrow space. It only took me a few more minutes before I reached another grate. This one wasn't so easily removed. I tugged at it, straining with all my might, 
but it refused to budge. None of the other greats had been difficult to shift, even for a child as young as I was. I must have made a lot of noise as I tried to move the metal bars because the strange sound stopped. My eyes widened as I realised I'd disturbed the creature. I was just about to turn around and make a break for the surface when a terrifying shape appeared on the other side of the grate. I'm not ashamed to say, I screamed. The creature in the other room stumbled back and pressed what I assumed were its hands to its head. When I stopped screaming, it lowered those odd five-fingered hands to its side and smiled at me with yellowed teeth. It spoke strangely with sounds that made no sense to my ears. I frowned and then looked fervently behind me into the dark mouth of the tunnel I was sitting at the edge of. Maybe I could still escape. When I didn't respond to the creature's strange words, it moved closer to me, its odd dark eyes crinkling at the corners. You, um, little chunga, it said stiltedly, startling me when it spoke in my tongue. I, the creature said, placing its pale hands against its funny flat chest, am Ben. It then reached out its hand to me. I squealed and scrambled back. The creature lifted its hands up in the sign of peace and made shushing sounds. I crawled back to the grate, my heart pounding but my mind curious as to what this strange creature was. It looked nothing like me, with heavy lines on its face, a pointed nose and fluffy white stuff that danced about the top and bottom of its head. My grey eyes looked at it between thick, heavy strands of hair. Every chunga had twelve that by the deity's decree were never to be cut. Why were there no strands on the stranger's head? Its fluff seemed like it had no beginning and no end. The creature rose his hands once more to his chest and repeated the word, Ben. I'd never heard such a word before, but when he held out his hand and asked, You? I knew he was asking my name. Tutal, I said quietly. The smile he gave me was dazzling. Hello, Dudal, he said as his hands fluttered in front of him in an official greeting. Against my best of judgment, though what child of my age even has any, I smiled, my lips parting to reveal my small teeth. They had just been sharpened on my fifth rotation, signalling that I was no longer a baby. I was very proud of my teeth. Hello, Bien, I said, trying to get my tongue around the stranger's unusual name. I didn't know it then, but that night would change my life forever. I would crawl down that tunnel at every chance I got to see my strange friend. We would exchange stories and try to speak in each other's tongues. It usually went badly, and we'd be left laughing as we made silly sounds and said rude things by accident. One day... It was close to my eighth rotation, I think. Ben told me about his planet and his family. I cried for a week when he said it had been more than 12 rotations since he'd crashed on our planet and that he knew he'd never see his son again. He hoped that Charlie, his son, had grown up into a fine young man and that his wife, Ben never told me her name, had found someone else who could love her as much as he did. It didn't seem fair, this kind stranger from the stars not being able to get home. When I asked him if he would go home if he could, Ben looked at me sadly and explained that his planet was sick and he was part of a team trying to find a new place to live. The people who had lived on his planet weren't like the people of Tuna. They couldn't hear the songs of the trees or the speech of the ocean or understand the chittering of the animals. They weren't connected to their planet. Their bodies didn't bleed when the planet bled. They weren't born from the flowers of the Tufula plant. I asked him why they didn't try to make the planet Earth, he called it, better. He told me they did try, but some powerful people cared more for money than the ground they walked on. And then he told me about the wars and the fighting. I was so horrified that I ran away before he could finish the story and didn't go back in that tunnel for almost 12 moons. Shortly after my 13th rotation, I realised that it was almost impossible to fit in the tunnels anymore. Going forward was okay if I stayed on my stomach, but getting back wasn't possible anymore. 
I cried the night I realised, thinking I would never see my strange old friend again. I yelled and screamed and begged the deity to make me small again, to stop changing my body into a woman's and let it stay like a child's. But the deity didn't listen. I kept growing. It was almost an entire rotation before I worked out how to break into Father's lab. It hadn't been hard to figure out where Ben was kept. What was hard was trying to figure out how to get in. Though our people are peaceful, we are not perfect, as my father often reminded me. If we were, we wouldn't need the deity, he would say. Instead, he argued that we would be the deity. I thought that was silly, but he believed it, so I didn't argue. Unfortunately, Father's belief meant he kept the laboratory secured with more locks and funny devices than any other place I knew. But I was curious and stubborn, and I missed my friend. One night, I managed to get in. I was terrified. I snuck through Father's lab like there was a grumble in the building, which would find me and eat me if I made any noise. What did I know? Maybe Father really did have a grumble locked up in there too. Despite my slow advance through the building, finding Ben didn't take me long. I forgot the need to be quiet and rushed toward the glass wall that had been hidden from my view when I'd been crammed into the tunnel. Ben! Ben! I cried, waving and smiling through my happy tears. He looked up at me from where he'd been sitting on a small couch. His eyebrows raised in surprise and a watery smile pulled at his lips. I was shocked at how much he'd changed. While I'd grown larger, gaining height and weight, Ben looked like he'd shrunk. The funny lines that had always marked his face looked deeper, and his skin had a weird yellow tinge. His cheekbones were sharp, and the hands he shakily reached out to me were skin and bones. My tears of joy turned to tears of sorrow. What was happening to my friend? We talked for a while through that glass wall before he grew too tired to speak. I told him about my last year and everything I'd been learning at school, even though I knew he'd fallen asleep, pressed against the transparent barrier. It isn't fair, I thought as I hugged my knees and picked at a few flaking scales on the back of my hand. I'd worked so hard to see Ben again, and he was sick. I was still sitting there watching him when my father walked in. Tutal, he said in shock. I sprung to my feet and winced. I was going to be in a lot of trouble for breaking into his lab. Good evening, father, I said, straightening, trying to appear that it wasn't unusual for us to meet like this. He He looked at me fondly. For all the things you could say about my father, you couldn't say he didn't love me. I see you've met Ben, he eventually said breaking the tense silence. I nodded and turned round, placing my palm flat on the glass. What's happened to him? I whispered. My father's eyes flashed with understanding. He knew this wasn't the first time I'd encountered the stranger. He's sick, dying. I've tried everything, but I don't know how to save him. Father then explained that when Ben was first discovered, he'd petitioned to the council to let him study the strange creature instead of killing and dissecting him in fear of who and what he was. Upon receiving permission, Father built the laboratory and tried to make Ben stay comfortable, even as he observed the stranger. It wasn't long before the receivers chose me to be gifted the next child born of the Tufula flowers that we finally started to understand each other. Ben became my friend, Father finished sadly, his hand reaching out to settle on the cool glass next to mine. Father let me visit Ben every night after I'd finished my homework. That time has been seared into my memory and is why I do what I do. Ben spoke more about Earth during that time than he'd ever done before. He mourned the fact that he'd never be buried with his family. I'd had to ask him what he meant and was surprised to learn that on his planet they often placed the bodies of the dead beneath the grass and soil. Here, the spirits of those who passed live with the stars and light the deity's path. Their bodies, which they don't need anymore, a return to the Tufula plant so that another child can be born. 
It was three moons before my 15th rotation when my father met me at the door of our house after school. I didn't need the green robes to tell me someone had died. The tears in his eyes would have said it just as plainly. I dropped my school pack to the ground in sorrow. The echo of its thump as it hit the floor still reverberates through my mind almost 20 rotations later. Without a word, I spun round and ran to the laboratory, my feet flying across the ground. Ben was still there, lying in his bed. I could almost imagine that he had just fallen asleep while we'd been talking. But I knew that wasn't the truth. His eyes stared blankly up at the ceiling and his chest was still. There was no more rattle as he breathed, no more coughs that shook his body. I fell to my knees and cried, curling into my father's embrace when he joined me and lowered himself to the floor to comfort me. My 35th rotation was last week, and today, me and my team of five are leaving Tuna. We are star searchers and have been travelling among the lights of our ancestors for many years, always remembering to return home to our fathers, mothers, sons and daughters. Today, though is special. We found Earth. I'm going to take my friend home. I'm going to fulfill the vow I made on the cold floor of the laboratory that day. And just as I will be given to the Tufula plant, Ben will be buried with his people. We smile and wave for the news feeds before ascending the ramp onto our star flyer. The journey is long and we almost turn back. Perhaps one day, I'll tell the story of our adventures and mishaps as we are guided by the lights of our ancestors just as the deity is. But we prevail. I stand here this morning on the ground of a new planet, squinting in the foreign yellow light, surrounded by a hundred curious faces who look so much like Ben that I want to cry. I take a deep breath, summon my bravery, and willing my tongue to speak in words long forgotten. Hello. I'm Tutal, and I have come to bury my friend. This world is old and scarred by wars and neglect, but to me, the white fluffy clouds and the kaleidoscope of colours made by the skin and hair of the people around me signal something new, something exciting, something to love and explore. It is a brand new world, and maybe we can help her live. Thanks so much, Jessica. And now we move on to our next fiction winner, staff member Ginny Jory. Once you hear her story, it'll be no surprise to you that she works at the Hocken Collections. Her story is called A Discovery, Donor Unknown. Craig, what did you love about this story? This one was a bit different to some of the others where it started in the, in the brave new world. This one started in a really familiar place. And as you say, I was playing this guessing game. Is this the Hocken? Does this person work in the Hocken? So that was a little uh, free song for me. I was excited by that. But then it starts in this recognisable, ordinary world, but then it gets stranger and weirder. And it was really exciting to be um, stretched and, and, and to wonder as we're going, how far is this going to take us? Yeah. Thanks, Craig. And now we'd like to welcome Ginny to the show. Hi, Ginny. Kia ora. Ginny, tell us about your story and how you came to write it. Uh, yes. So this was really inspired a lot by what I do as a job. So I work, I'm a collections assistant at the Hocken Library. Um, so we've got lots of fantastical collections, lots of archives, lots of old photos, lots of really cool serials and publications. Um, so I feel like I'm just always seeing all these cool historical things coming through. Um, and I did a history degree, so I'm really interested in that sort of stuff. Um, and then I guess the sort of weird part of it is very inspired by my ongoing Dungeons & Dragons game that I play with my friends. Um, my character in that game is a siren, so it was just sort of like pulling from all the things that I do, so I've sort of written this story about a librarian who sort of uncovers this new world with all these like mythological creatures being real. Um, so yeah, just sort of, I've been doing writing sessions with a friend to sort of like just get into it more regularly, um, but this was not really something that happened in one of those sessions. It was like a struggling to sleep night and then it was just like 1am and it was just like these words started going through my head and I was like, I have to get up, I have to write this down or I'm not going to remember it. 
So I didn't end up going to sleep till about two or three in the morning because I was just typing furiously on my phone, being like, I need to write this down. Um, but yeah, that's sort of how it came about. <laughs> Oh, that's a great origin story. Thank you, Ginny. And now we'd love to hear it. Okay. You find a lot of interesting things working at a historical library. You never know why, what might be donated or what you might retrieve for a patron. For example, just last week we received donations of early newspapers, artworks of cats, early photos of the area, and I retrieved an archive that contained pictures of my grandmother. It's all very interesting and the people who bring them in always have long stories to tell about how these items came into their possession. But it's all run-of-the-mill, standard historical fare. Never anything unexplained or unusual. That was until the donation I received on Saturday afternoon. We have less staff on the premises on the weekend, so it was just the four of us, and I was in the office covering a lunch break when he came in. He looked frazzled, his glasses askew on his face as he pushed through the doors with a giant box, full to bursting with the lid teetering dangerously on top. I started going through the usual process, filling out the receipt form with him, but he was being oddly cagey with his details. The material, he said, belonged to his late mother, who had recently passed, so I could use her estate's information on the receipt. Under no circumstances, he emphasised, did he want any of the material returned if we didn't want it for our collection. He would rather see it burned, he said, than back in his spare room. When I asked what sort of items were in the box, he waved his hand. Oh, some marine biology stuff. She was an enthusiast, he said, studying the local marine life off the coast by her house. She collected all sorts, but he had thrown away a lot of the junk, shells, and bits that weren't archive quality, he said, making quotation marks with his hands. When I pressed further, saying I might need to pass items on to different curators, he said there were some publications, a lot of personal papers, some recordings she had made, as well as a few photo albums. No sooner had I obtained his own unintelligible signature and given him the copy of the receipt, had he rushed off, scrunching up the form within viewing distance of my desk and hurling it into the bin outside. Just like that, he was gone, and I would never see him again. I took the box back to my desk after lunch, resolved to sort through it so that I could send items off to the relevant curators before Monday. Many items were as described, photos of a coastline I could vaguely pick the location of, a book on mollusks, sketches of rock pools, a scientific community newsletter, and what looked like papers detailing some sort of research project. There was also a dusty pile of labelled cassettes and a portable deck player, the kind I had as a kid in the 90s with tinny headphones that looked like you could snap them in half. There was already a cassette in the player. Curiosity got the better of me. It would be helpful anyway to know what was on them. The labels were old, peeling and smudged. On this one I could only make out a short word that started with S on the B side. I put new batteries in and shut myself in the breakout room. I hit play. It was crackly and fuzzy at first, like it hadn't been played in a while. Then I could make out the sound of the seaside. Seagulls cawing overhead and the gentle rocking of waves as if they were hitting up against something. It was pleasant, but nothing groundbreaking. Just the sounds of a life lived, like so many other items in our collections. There was a static hiss and for a second I was sure I had wrecked the tape and the ribbon was about to come spewing out, all distorted and unplayable, and I was about to be in big trouble. The static stopped, and a song began. It was the most beautiful sound I have ever heard, and in that moment, I was obsessed. My heart was caught in my throat as this strange voice somehow reached into the depths of my very soul, pulling out emotions I had long since buried. There were no lyrics, only notes somehow layered over each other, despite it being clear there was only one voice. It couldn't be human. No music had ever expressed such a yearning that hit so quickly to my core. I felt a huge pressure around me as if I were diving deeper and deeper into something unkno unknowable. And then the pressure was gone. I wish I could say I felt guilty about what I did next, but that would be a lie. I stole the cassette, and the player, and the papers, and a book on Greek mythology I found squashed in the bottom. I flipped through the sketches, grabbing some anatomical drawings, and rifled through the photo albums. 
There was one photo that stood out, so I ripped it from its plastic enclosure and stuffed it in my bag. And then I walked out, trying my hardest not to run. Even with the player in my bag, the song was still echoing in my head. That was four days ago. I have called in sick to work each of those days. I have not been sick. I have been frantic. I have been examining papers, looking up biological terminology I had no reason to understand before, researching oceanic exploration, deep sea creatures, and even conspiracies like the aquatic ape, matching the photo to image searches of the local coastline. I have been reading Greek mythology and tracking similar myths throughout time. I have spent four days with one song stuck in my head, calling to me. The song lasts for the entirety of side B on the cassette. On side A, there are seven words spoken in a soft, quivering voice. Come with me, Calliope. Come with me. It is the singer. I am sure of it. So Calliope must be the marine biologist. Her papers are all so well written, so backed with scientific fact, at least from what I can make sense of it. But I can see why they were never submitted for peer review. Calliope was researching sirens, the mythological women who lured sailors to their watery graves, creatures who have somehow survived from ancient stories to modern media. Is their fictional pervasiveness based in fact? Calliope seemed to think so. And the photo. It was an old square Polaroid, the colour faded with age. It showed the head and shoulders of a woman in the ocean behind a rocky outcrop. It was hard to tell with the fading, but her skin looked blue. And every time I looked at it, the song in my head got a little louder, the pull a little stronger. I called in sick again. My manager texted to ask if I was all right. Instead of replying, I called the estate's lawyer. Mr. Wycliffe was very confused when I told him I had come into some of Calliope's possessions via her son. Miss Johnson was, he told me down the phone, a spinster. She never married, and she certainly never had any children who would have been keeping her possessions in their spare room. Did I think they were valuable? he asked, stricken. No, I replied, trying to sound casual. Just some research papers. But she seemed like such a fascinating woman, based on her research, I implored. And didn't she live locally? Just down the coast? Was there any chance a fellow researcher could perhaps see her house and any other papers the estate might hold? Mr. Wycliffe was not happy about this. Unfortunately, he told me, he was a very busy man, in charge of several estates and accounts. He would be unable to meet me to tour her house. He paused. However, he saw no reason why I couldn't go to her house and look around the property. It was, after all, a lovely example of colonial architecture, and even boasted its own private cove. He gave me her address, and an awkward silence hung in the air. I just had one last question, I said. What happened to Calliope? Oh, Mr. Wycliffe said, his tone suddenly soft. She drowned in that cove. You be careful if you go out there, he told me. I said I would, and he hung up. The two hours I spent waiting for my flatmate to get home so I could borrow their car felt like years. But then I was leaving, and I was going, and it felt right, and the song in my head was louder and clearer than ever before, and I almost didn't need my phone snapping directions at me. The pull was so strong. Come with me. Come with me. The words turned over and over in my head as I navigated the curves of the peninsula, their pull thrumming in my ears. Come where? The road eventually led to a dead end, with a small gate the only sign of humanity amongst the flax and fern. I left the car and let the song lead me through the gate and down a steep gravel path. The cottage was small, all white worn wood, with a cherry blue door. I knew the cottage would not contain the answers I was looking for. The gravel path led down further among rocks and long grasses until it revealed the small cove, as promised. Large rocks lined the shore and I clambered over them, slipping as I fumbled in my pocket. I pulled out the photo I had stolen, the shoreline with the figure floating in the water. Holding it up, I jumped between rocks until the photo lined up with the coast and horizon. Here. It was here. 
I lowered the photo and was met by an almost exact replica as a head broke the surface of the water in the exact spot she had been photographed. Did you know that only 15% of the ocean has been explored by humans? We have explored more of space, other planets and the stars than we have the water beneath our feet. Are we afraid to sink below where light can no longer penetrate? Would we rather explore far reaches of the cosmos where we might never see another human again than dive into the bathypelagic zone, the abyssopelagic zone, into the trenches of the hadalpelagic zone? Or were we stopped by some primal instinct that knew what ancient creatures of myth wait in the depths, telling us this world below is not for us, that we must stay within sight of the bright, reflective surface? We have always been afraid of the dark. Stay above, so what lives below doesn't find you. I am staring at what lives below. She bobs in the water and her head slowly cocks as she appraises me. I feel my own copy her movement. Her skin is a mottled blue-gray, her eyes abnormally large. Her hair floats gently around her and appears to have odd lights tangled through it. Bioluminescent, they give her a compelling glow as she lies in wait. She moves slightly closer, and I see the tip of a tail breach the water behind her. What are you doing here? As I hear her voice, really hear it this time, I realize that for the first time in almost a week, the song in my head is silent. All I hear is my heart pounding in my ears. Oh, I, uh, I found the cassette. I hold up the tape player strapped to the waistband of my pants. With your song? Oh. She says it softly, and a smile starts to play across her face. She moves closer still, right up to the edge of the rocks. Did you like it? I am already nodding when I notice that beneath her delicate smile is a row of needle-sharp, pointed teeth. I feel my whole body tense, my flight response trying to kick in. I want to step away. But she is beautiful in an ethereal, otherworldly way, and I find my feet moving closer to the edge. Her wide eyes are dark pools, and I see myself reflected in them. I can sing you another. She reaches out a hand, and I see her fingers are webbed, her nails sharp. But again I am nodding, and suddenly I am on my knees before her, supplicant, my hands grasping the edge of the rocks. Her hand rests atop mine. Not cold, as I expected, but soft, and a little slimy, though not unpleasant. This close, I can see the gills on her throat move in and out as she breathes. It doesn't even seem like her mouth moves as I hear a new song, full of that same yearning. Again, there are no words, only layered melodies, but I still derive their meaning. I feel the pull again. I feel the need to swim deeper than any person has before, to go below where light can reach. I feel like I will be safe there, warm, wanted, home. Will you come with me? The break in the song pulls me back to reality and I feel myself pulling away, scrambling back up the rock. The hurt is palpable in her face. Aren't you brave? I take a breath and shut my eyes. I am a librarian. I am a historian. Is that not a type of explorer? What if, instead of finding new worlds and books, I could find one for myself? I can be brave, I say. Looking behind me for a rock that will be above the tide line, I neatly stack my boots, rings, and the tape player. I take out my phone and ping my location to my flatmate so they can find their car, and then I sit it in my shoes. I turn around. Come with me. She holds out a hand, imploring. Again I kneel and I take her hand in my own. She slowly pulls my hand, arm and body into the water. As she pulls me closer, I'm not afraid. Her song sings again in my head and I know those teeth will not be used on me. Our noses are almost touching now. Come with me, she whispers it into my ear. And then I am pulled below. Thanks so much, Ginny. 
That brings us to our final winner, our alumni short story winner, Rebecca Stiles. Rebecca graduated in 2010 with an honours degree in English. After leaving Otago, she completed a Master's in Creative Writing at the International Institute of Modern Letters and then a PhD in Creative Writing at Massey University. She's currently an investigative writer at Consumer New Zealand and teaches short story writing part-time at Wellington High School Community College. With all of that behind her, it's no wonder her entry, stock levels, stood out to Craig. So Craig, do tell us, what, st- what drew you to this story? I think the first thing is it's got a mystery. What goes on in the toilet paper aisle? And that's a really good hook. That's a great elevator pitch. It's, that makes me want to read on. It's also got humour in it. It's got interesting characters. So it's got all the building blocks of a really good story. And I just found it immensely enjoyable and, and thought-provoking. And I, I, I knew straight away that I was in uh, good hands and that... Um, once I found out that um, the background of, of the author, it all makes sense. Thanks, Craig. And now we can introduce you to Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Styles. Welcome, Rebecca. Hiya. Thanks for having me. Rebecca, what inspired you to enter the competition and to write your piece? Um, I think it was a combination of the theme. Um, it sort of, um, I usually write quite realist stuff really um, and I guess it made me um, experiment a bit and branch out and I'd been, I write a lot about consumer issues uh, like about privacy and um, supermarket duopolies and this kind of thing and I, it's kind of hard to get people on board with the privacy issues and I had been thinking for a while that oh, you know, you know, I think maybe fiction is a better way to reach people to see you know, the worst case scenario of no privacy data. So um, yeah, it was just a bit of an experiment really. And the theme sort of lent itself to what I'd been thinking of. So I just yeah, sat down and did it. Thanks, Rebecca. And now we're going to hear your winning story, Stock Levels. Take it away, our final winner, Rebecca Styles. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's Stock Levels. It's my job to match the facial recognition image to the customer's loyalty card data. Customers get scanned at the entrance and again at the checkout. Once they swipe their loyalty card, we've got their face, name and shopping data. It's to help stock levels, David, the manager, a balding middle-aged man with a bare belly says. The polo t-shirt of his uniform doesn't quite tuck in at the front, so you get occasional flashes of hairy belly when he reaches for anything. There's three of us matching faces to loyalty cards. My workmates, Barb and Deb, are eagle-eyed. I think I know everyone in this town now, says Barb, the senior inputter. But they don't know you, says Deb, laughing. Barb and Deb have been working together for years. They sometimes call me their underling. I take it as a term of endearment. They do look after me. They take turns bringing and baking and always making sure I take my breaks. Through one-way black glass, we can see the shop floor, the bank of checkouts, the displays of two-for-one chips for $3.99. A row of sanitary and beauty products faces a checkout, a security measure. They are the most frequently shoplifted items. When we've got a name from the loyalty card and image, we can bring up the customer's file, which will have any previous warnings for shoplifting, whether we've let them off or called the police, whether they've been banned. If we do clock someone coming in who's been banned, we ring security and they escort them out. They scream usually when that happens. Last week it was Verona Milne, 35. Her most purchased items were two litres of blue milk and cans of baked beans. Nappies are her most expensive item. She was caught stealing depilatory cream. When a security guard apprehended her, he said she smelt like off milk. She had screamed at him, there's nowhere else to go, how am I going to feed my kids? She's right, there is nowhere else to go. The closest supermarket is an hour's drive away. There's only two major chains, and this one, where I work, up all the surrounding land so no competitors can open up nearby. You can only hope that Verona has a friend who can do her shopping for her. There are customers we recognise straight away, regulars. Teddy, the 80-year-old who comes in daily at 9am to buy a fresh half loaf, white, unsliced. He scans the magazines, flicks through some pages, reads an article or two, but never buys one before he heads to the checkout. Every Thursday he does a full shop, which only fills up half a trolley. The items week by week are near exact. 
three tins of whole tomatoes, 500 grams of mince, kidney beans and a sachet of chili con carne mix, three bananas and two apples, easy cook rice, three sachets. The fluorescent light shine on Teddy's head. He moves freely for an 80-year-old. He just lives around the corner. When we match his grocery data with his power data, we can confirm he's frugal. He only heats one room. The TV's on all day. The chili con carne is on the stove for 40 minutes and the rice takes two minutes in the microwave. The bread he eats for breakfast and lunch. The toast pops up after two minutes. He likes it quite crisp. His data isn't as valuable as others. Household data of three or more people is better to get an accurate picture of the larger population's habits, their wants and needs, what they do in their spare time, how long they're out for work. That's the data that gets the top price because it can be mined for so many variables. That's what David says anyway. While we send Teddy advertising on a more balanced diet, the analysis suggests he's not eating a variety of fruit and veg. Others we send more personal advice. Tracy, a 45-year-old public servant and mum, we send skin care advice. Her skin is prematurely ageing, too many hours in the sun. The freckles and moles could turn cancerous if she doesn't take more care. In that way, it's saving the healthcare system valuable money. It's preventative. There are other teams who check on whether people are taking the advice. Some commentators say we have too much data, that it's using people's private information to punish them. But when it's saving money and people's health, it's a bit hard to argue against. I've only been sent a few emails to correct my behaviour. They're for my own good, of course. I don't fight it when I get it. Not like some who don't even open the emails but delete them straight away. There's no point in that, really. We can tell when that happens. It just means someone will end up at your door to talk you through some corrective behaviour. I must work on eating more protein. It doesn't have to be meat, the email said. Dairy and non-dairy options are available. I have been trying, but it is expensive, all the protein. I buy the recommended amount each week at the supermarket, though I don't get through it all sometimes, which is a terrible waste. And sometimes I just can't get it down. I nearly gag on the steak or chicken, but I get encouraging emails telling me I'm doing well. I don't feel any different health-wise, but the experts know best, I guess. They say I'll have more energy and feel fuller for longer. Barb asked me about my protein levels. She's meant to cut back on sugar because she's pre-diabetic, while Deb needs to get more exercise. Easier said than done, I can tell you, says Deb. She's not terribly overweight, just a bit of extra padding. You've got to have something to fall back on, says Deb. Ed, the morning fill supervisor, stops as he's passing. You'll probably get an email saying that's a myth, he jokes. Ed starts work at 4am, Monday to Saturday. Sunday, they don't fill. At the end of every shift at 8am, he comes up and chats to Barb in the office. He is quite short, just over five foot. He doesn't shave often. His facial hair is about a centimetre long and grows down his neck over his Adam's apple. I wonder whether the display of testosterone the facial hair suggests is to com compensate for his lack of height. He's friendly enough. All right, kid, is his greeting to everyone, except he calls Barb and David by their names. Ed is always in charge of the toilet paper aisle. He fills it. He might get one of the younger ones to go up top and push some stock down, but he fills the shelf. He was always very particular about the right stock numbers. It must be packed. There's always a run on it, he said. The numbers back this up. From all the customer data, toilet paper is the one thing 95% of shoppers buy. No one likes to dwell on the toilet habits of the other 5%. There can't be that many bidets, Ed said. The morning filler filmed, of course, yet there are a few blind spots in the supermarket, a few corners where the cameras don't reach. One is in the corner of the bakery by the packs of pita bread. The other is down is in the first aisle down by the toilet paper. They've tried many different angles to get a camera on the area to no avail, aside from installing another camera for those spots, but the manager said that would be overkill. What could anyone possibly get away with in that tight spot, David asks. Bob is always early to work. It just gives me a chance to catch my breath, she'll say when asked why she is so early. A chance to have a cuppa in peace. Her two grown-up sons are at home, and one of them has a partner and baby who is living there too. It's a madhouse some days, Barb says, smiling. After a cuppa, she'll go over the tapes just to see if anything untoward happened overnight. Things have gone missing in the past, she says. What happens to the people who are banned, like Verona, I asked Barb. 
has been playing on my mind at random moments, like when I'm cooking tea or standing at the lights waiting for the cross signal. Oh, I wouldn't worry about her. I'm sure someone is looking after her. Bob turns around to face me from her screen where she had just identified someone at the checkout. But who? Family, most likely. I'm sure she's not starving. Bob picked up her tea and took a sip. Why are you so worried about her? Well, she had kids, didn't she? I mean, it's not just her, but anyone banned. The nearest door is miles away. Yes, it's a shame, all right, but what can you do? She shrugs her shoulders and turns back to the screen. She, she shouldn't have nicked stuff. Ed doesn't turn up for work on Monday. Barb looks worried. Where the hell is he? This isn't like him at all. When he doesn't turn up on Tuesday, she starts calling around and trawling through data. She puts requests into central data support for any recent sightings. They say they don't have any sightings, Barb said. She looks on the verge of tears. The bastards have got him. What? I was surprised she swore and unsure who it was that had him. Deb swears too. Jesus Christ, what will we do? The pair stare at each other and I know I'm missing something, but I'm too scared to ask what. They turn to me at the same time. How would you feel doing a morning shift just to fill in until Ed's back, asks Barb. It feels like they are sizing me up. I'm about the same height as Ed, just a bit thinner. Well, if that'll help, sure. Good, I'll meet you at the side door at 4 a.m. tomorrow, says Barb. I go to protest. She doesn't need to meet me, but the intent of her stare keeps me silent. I asked you because you seem concerned about people, says Barb the following morning, standing outside the door to the stock room. Right, I was puzzled. I didn't think you needed to be worried about people to fill some shells. Now, before we go in, I need to explain a few rules. The air was brisk and it was so dark, Barb's voice was disembodied. You need to do what I say, no questions asked. And what you see in there, you can't tell anyone or else you might, in, you might disappear like Ed did, okay? I nod, which of course Barb can't see in the dark. Okay, yes, of course. This obviously isn't just about filling some shells. The other morning, Phil staff look at me with suspicion while Barb says good morning to everyone. Right, so you'll be on toilet paper later, okay? Sure, I said, not really knowing if that was a good or bad thing. I'll help you this morning and then you'll be on your own. It was what I expected at the start. I filled up the beans, dried pasta and canned soup. Then Barb takes me to the toilet paper aisle. There's a gap in the toilet paper. It almost looks like a door to an igloo. It's just big enough for me to get into. Right, you go through there, so said Barb. I crouch down and go through the opening. I was just expecting to see some toilet paper, but what I found was stacks of canned food, milk powder, pasta and rice. I turn back to Barb, who follows me into the gap with some difficulty. She is taller and a bit wider than me, her body not as pliable in small spaces. That's for all the people who get banned. We bag it up and send it out. At the far end of the cave is a door that leads out to the stockroom. It's on camera, but every morning Barb wipes the footage from that area. How does the food get in here? Well, it comes out of the stockroom and some boxes just don't get put on the shelf. It's a camera blind spot at the loop paper, so every filler drops off a box on the way to the shelf. It was sorted and bag it up, ready to be shipped out. How long has this been going on? It's best you don't know, but you can put your mind at ease about band shoppers. We're looking after them. But doesn't David notice the stock levels? Ed fudges the numbers. Some of the drivers don't. Note it's come off the truck. There are ways. After my initial surprise, I got down to work putting groceries into bags. The head of accounts was in on it too. She'd make the stock tape figures marry with what had been sold. All the health tips they give us has made us so sharp we know how to get around the system, Barb laughs. So began my covert morning film. We never saw Ed again. Barb said he'd been in touch with her. He could feel them circling, so he went off grid. We won't see him anytime soon, she said. She had a worried look in her eyes. Whether that was from missing Ed or wondering whether she'd have to do the same thing one day, I wasn't sure. What would they do if they got him? They don't share that data, she shrugs. No one really knows what happens to people who try to live off-grid. They're not valuable then. If they're not producing data to be sold, they become expendable. I nod, knowing that one day I could be expendable too. Thanks, Rebecca. That brings us now to the end of our show. Thank you all for listening. We're just going to round out with some thanks. Firstly, to our judge, Craig Cliff. Thanks, Craig, for your time and wonderful choices. 
Thanks also to our winning entrants for taking time out of their busy lives to share their works with us. And finally, thanks to our sponsors. Yeah, our competition wouldn't have been possible without our sponsors, who supported and encouraged us. They are the Otago Daily Times, University Bookshop, Otago University Press, English and Linguistics Programme in the School of Arts at the University of Otago, Dunedin UNESCO City of Literature, and the amazing Otago Access Radio. Thank you to each of these organisations. We hope hearing these winning stories has encouraged you to put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard yourself. We'll be running the competition again next year, so if you are a student, staff or alumni of the University of Otago, keep a lookout for the competition in semester two next year. That's in about July. Ka kite anō, thanks for joining us. This podcast was produced by ORFM Dunedin with support from New Zealand On the Air.